Hi everyone and welcome to Asami Rat Care. So today's video is going to be about the first week of um, Alyssa's life. So this is a continuation of my breeding series and it's following in particular Mog and her brood and actually to some extent um, her sister Isola and her brood from Lovecraft Rats. So um, where are we now? So today the babies have all turned um, a week old. They're uh, doing very well, I will say. Um, and Mog no longer just has the six that she birthed um, last last week, she also has another five from her sister Isola's litter and they were fostered across because Isola was struggling to produce milk. Um, so now Mog is raising a very kind of happy and healthy litter of 11. Um, you can see on my board behind me they have their kind of weights up, I'll talk a little bit about that later and what I record data wise at this stage. But um, what I thought I'd try and do with this, and I'm going to try and follow it through each week of their lives. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the habitat side of things. Some weeks that will change a lot, some weeks it won't. I'm going to talk a little bit about handling and um, socialisation, what I do, that kind of thing. Um, talk about feeding and then kind of just general comments, things to look out for and so on. So habitat. Currently, um, Mog and her litter are still in the, exactly the same cage they did in the birthing cage video, so they're still in the Alaska. I haven't added anything into there. However, um, Mog has built a fabulous nest out of all the stuff. It started out, um, and what you quite often find, some rats will start building a nest before the litter is born, some will start afterwards. Um, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't say anything about them, it's just one of those things. They, they will choose when they feel ready. So what happened with Mog? Mog started to build her nest, um, I'd say just before she gave birth. Um, the night before I noticed she was spending a lot more activity kind of making something. It wasn't a fully blown nest but it was a bit more of a lump than it had, was before. Um, and now she's, like over the next kind of few days and, and up to now, she now has this fabulous donut nest, which is like a big ring around it. I'll stick up a picture um, with a nice little hollow in the centre, which goes down to the plastic, which is quite normal, actually. Um, and then the little babies just sit in that little hollow. And then when she comes out to see me um, or to get fed or something, she will cover that over the top and make it kind of a little lid on top of it to keep the babies nice and warm. Um, which works really well. So it's a very functional nest actually. It's quite solid sides. Um, she has a little tunnel out the front that she comes out, well, say front, the back. So she'll come out of the back of the nest and then pop round to the front and see me, which works really well. Um, so that's kind of how her nest works. I haven't had anything more in and I haven't cleaned her out. For a start, it's not smelling yet, um, which is not a bad thing. It's, they sometimes do start getting a bit smelly at this stage. But to be fair, Mog didn't have a heavy birth, so there's not a lot of blood and such on the, the substrate. Um, if she had and it was starting being a bit smelly I wouldn't feel comfortable cleaning out at this stage but what I would do is spot clean so I'd pull out anything that's particularly kind of dirty mucky bedding um, if I either had toilet corners then I would clear out that toilet corner I'm probably not going to clean Mog out until maybe 10 days maybe a little bit after she has had a bit of disruption lately with me um, sticking a handful of extra babies in yesterday so I like to kind of give them a bit of time to settle not that Mog is the type of rat that's going to be fussed at all by um, the clean-out procedure, but um, some, rats, some rats are, some rats do get a bit stressed by it, and it does ultimately change the smell of their safe area, so you've got to consider that too. So first week, try not to clean out, and that's quite a good thing in terms of habitat. Otherwise, as is, spot clean as necessary. So then we're going to talk about feeding. Now feeding is very much dependent on the doe in question. Um, I should say in the first week there isn't a massive call on the doe's resources. Um, even if she's got a, quite a big litter, it's they're still very small. They're not drawing a, a lot of, of kind of nutrients from her. Um, but if it is a small litter, they're basically drawing nothing at all. So you need to feed her as though, she, if, if it's a small litter, as though she's not really got any extras other than giving her extra supplements. She does need extra supplements, calcium particularly, vitamin D particularly. Um, but yes, yeah, so you don't need to give her much, much extra for a very small litter. Um, Mog with taking on the extras, I have up to food a little bit. I wouldn't say I'm feeding her loads at the moment. Um, I'm giving her a bit of extra protein. Um, I occasionally give her extra wet meals. That's mostly as a way of sneaking stuff in. Um, so what I tend to give is, I don't know, probably about 15, 20 grams of dry mix, probably about 15 grams, then I'll give a little bit of extra kibble to put, top that up. Um, there isn't a right amount though, and I really want to stress this because not every rat needs the same, and when they're pregnant it's more important than ever. Um, what you want to kind of aim for, you don't want the mum to get too fat, but you don't want her to, thin, to, to feel thin and, and skinny. 
Um, in fact, you don't want her to be a normal kind of ideal shape. You want her to have a little bit of extra because next week's stuff is going to start building up. It's going to get a bit more difficult for her. In fact, week two to three is probably the heaviest kind of drag on their resources. Um, so I am starting a little bit to feed her a bit more now. Um, but yes, you don't want her to be really, really fat at this stage, ideally, either, because she doesn't need all that extra weight. It'll just take more for her to get off at the end of it as well. Um, unless she's got a massive litter and then you might think she was probably going to lose it shortly anyway. So basically I'm feeding a kind of not much more than normal, but higher protein, which is why I add the kibble. So what I literally do is, um, and it's the way I feed, I feed in my normal dry mix, um, which you've seen from, I think, the complex mix that I've mixed. It's actually probably still literally that bad because I made up quite a lot. Um, I'll feed her a bit of this and then I keep an extra tub with kind of high protein kibble in, a small bite stuff where I can. And I'll just add a little bit more. And that can range anything from one to ten, which is kind of like low amounts, up to kind of maybe one to five, kind of one to four levels. So I'll judge it very much by how I think the rat's doing and what you're looking for in the coat. Is the, is the coat coming a bit straggly and rough? Is the tail getting a little bit square? Are they looking a bit skinny? The same with the babies. Are the babies looking solid? Um, and you can increase the amount of protein to help with that if needs be, as well as the amount of calories overall. And she is getting supplements basically every day. So by supplements, I mean vitamin D, um, calcium um, and other bits and pieces. So actually I'm giving various B vitamins and folic acid, which is one of the B vitamins, which is very good for kind of growing babies. Uh, and I'm doing that in a number of ways. So I've got some um, Dr. Squiggles Daily Essentials and calcium out, which I put in the water every probably two, two days ish. But I'm also adding to any wet food that I give her, I'm adding um, Daily Rat 3, which covers calcium, vitamin D and copper. Um, and a little bit of um, yeast flakes. I don't know if I showed you the box later, but I'll grab some. Ta -da! Which is nice and high in um, B vitamins, folic acid and such. And then a little bit of oil, um, salmon oil. I'm, I'm trying not to give that too often because that is quite high in vitamin A. And I'm also giving occasionally seaweed powder, which is great for kind of um, minerals and such. So she's getting supplemented far more than I would supplement a normal rat, but the, the babies are doing a lot of growing, so they need all of that. And um, actually, she's she's in great shape. She's lovely, shiny coated. If she decides to get up, I'll show you. But currently, she's feeding the babies. You can hear them singing in the background when I'm quiet. Um, so I'm going to leave her be at the moment. Um, so that's actually a nice lead on to the next bit. So that's handling. Um, my handling, I basically handle from, um, I'll say first day, but the first day with a proviso. It's basically a good four or five hours after the mum has finished giving birth, or you're pretty sure she has. And then it's on her terms that first day. It's quite important that if she chooses to leave the nest, um, I will do it. In fact, to be honest, I'll probably try and persuade her to leave the nest at least at some point, um, just so I can check her over and make sure she's not discharging or get anything stuck. Um, so I'll try and tempt her to the bars, but I won't necessarily handle the babies unless mum seems very relaxed, very happy to come to me, happy to come out, not stressed when I put her in a little carrier with a bit of food, then I'll kind of quickly check on the babies. Um, I tend not to do very much on that first day. If I do get them out, it's literally a quick whiz. Have they got a milk band? Put them back in. Count them up type thing. Remove any dead babies. And you do quite often get dead babies. Um, and you can leave them in there and sometimes mum will clean up so she will eat the babies. And um, that's very natural. There's nothing wrong with that. That's her recovering nutrients. It's a, a very sensible thing if you're in the wild. And um, not a bad thing really to do for her um, in this case. So... But if they stay in the nest, mums don't always clean them up and they can be quite cold um, and they can make the other babies cold. So I will generally, if they're there and I see them and she's not made a clear attempt at eating them, I'll throw them in the bin. Um, sometimes I'll give it, let's say, half a day and see whether she clears up her, her, her own accord. Um, but normally mine don't do it. To be fair, they get plenty of food and they'll have also eaten the placentas and such that first day. So it's, it's unlikely that the mums entirely clean them up. So... Um, that's kind of what I do on the first day and then through the week it's very much uh, morning and evening I'll see if mum wants to come off the nest if she does then um, I'll pop her out give her a cuddle <laughs> um, I am fond of my, my girls um, and then I'll pop her in a little mini cage to have a bit of a meal whilst I kind of get out the babies check on them in this case particularly take a few photos and um, basically hold them for a bit but I will say the first few days they've got no fur whatsoever in fact probably most of the first week they've, they've got no fur um, that means they get cold very quickly so you're talking about a few minutes at most um, and what, what I kind of do particularly the first couple of days my priority is have a quick check that they're safe 
if I've still got time, um, particularly with a small litter like I've got now, I will quickly try and sex them. So you're looking at um, the general folds for this. I'll pop up a little photo, which is really quite useful um, over here, which is talking about, um, well, it just demonstrates the two babies and don't, don't book. And the way you tell the difference is the different distance between the genitals. Um, in dark books, it's really handy because they also quite often have what I call the ball spot, <laughs> um, which is uh, a couple of dark spots just where the balls are going to fall, or testicles, um, if you want to use the proper name. Um, and that makes it really easy. But I also have topazes in this litter and they do not have ball spots, which is inconvenient of them, but as part of life. Um, but the, the kind of distance between the genitals is Di quite different between book and doe and actually also the appearance of the genitals so I'll talk about a little nub so on the book there is a larger nub that's what the penis is going to be and it, and it is distinctly different to the doe's kind of much more tidy tiny little nub which is her kind of urethra and that is also split so you can see the difference and um, you may be able to see some nipple nipples later on but not at this stage um, but generally speaking I find day one it can be a little bit um, easy to get them mistaken but after day one it becomes um, far easier and, and tends to be fairly straightforward um, from then on really. Um, it's what I would advise, my, my first litter, I literally had a kind of little picture guide up next to me and <laughs> the babies, yes, no, my first litter was more complicated because I had all those and actually um, when you've got one of each it's really easy to see the difference most of the time and um, when you don't it becomes a lot harder so um, I had three does in my first litter, I was like is this a book, is this a book? And, no I'm sure it's not a book and it wasn't sadly as I kept books at the time. <laughs> so um, that's kind of the checks I do. So I'll check the sexing. I'll check the milk band. So a milk band is a pale band that sits across the belly of the baby. So if that ha shows up kind of, it'll show through particularly in the early days um, when there isn't any pigment on the rat, there's kind of a white band across the belly. If that's there, brilliant. If it isn't, um, try putting them back and leave them a little bit longer, give the doe a bit of time. It's critical for that first day particularly that you see something, and um, that's the colostrum, which is super powerful milk, um, full of extra stuff um, that they do need. Um, so you do want to see that first milk band. If it isn't there, then you have to start worrying, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And the same goes through. So in big litters, what you may find that a mum is struggling to feed all of them, which is actually what happened with the silver, which is why I currently have a lot more babies than I started out with. Um, and and that is that does happen sometimes. And then that's when you've got to think about the question, um, do you foster? So with the solar, we, the reason we've managed to keep it going until this stage is the babies were getting some milk, but they weren't ever getting full tummies. And it became quite apparent part of the way through the week that um, they were falling massively behind. To be fair on, on um, Isola, Mog's babies were fat little hippos. Um, you will see, I'll, I'll pop up um, a development kind of infographic that I did from day one till um, day six. And the difference is quite um, profound and how big and, and they're kind of like when they were first born and um, they were between about um, eight and ten grams born. Bear in mind that Isola's when they were first born were at about five grams. <laughs> And then you get to um, kind of current, well, the current day, and we've got like 20 grams, which is big for, for babies of a week old, or fairly big, you know, she's done very well there, versus the solars that were far less than that. In fact, yesterday they were kind of seven, eight, nine grams maximum, um, a day on Mog's milk, and they're doing a hell of a lot better. Uh, See, so she's um, got some good milk as Mog, which is always a nice thing in a dough, um, and is a very good mum. So, um, you can kind of see the difference there. This is when alarm bells started ringing that we actually had to do something a little bit different. And that's one of the things that can go wrong sometimes. You see that and you've got to act. And um, it was quite convenient. Me and Lisa are always tying our litters together. Even if we have multiple ones ourselves, it's always nice to have that backup of somebody else. Um, so Lisa could send five babies down to me and Mob could just take them in. <laughs> Rats are excellent foster mums. In fact, what I thought I'd do is do a quick video on fostering after this and kind of the practicalities, because I know it's the kind of thing that if you're a breeder, it can come up and you need to do it quickly. So I want it out of this video just so that you can find it quickly if you need to. And um, so I'll get onto that later. But yes, so that's the kind of thing I'm looking for at first. So as they go through each day, um, and I will say development very, very much depends on how many days the rats were cooked, for instance. And by that, I mean how many days they were in the mum. So um, you can actually see the difference between um, 
rats that are born on day 23 or day 24 versus rats born on day 22. So day 24 babies will normally be fairly well pigmented when they're born. Um, day 22 babies will not be, they'll be very pink still, they'll be smaller when they're born. Um, even the difference between Asolas on 22 and Mogs on day 23 was kind of quite pronounced in terms of size. Um, also litter size affects that too. Uh, so I wouldn't get hung up on everything having to happen at exactly the right time. But for instance, Mogs babies, the pigment cetacean came through on, or started coming through on day one, two, you could start seeing the babies getting a little bit darker. Um, actually from birth, you could tell the eye colour difference and that's really nice as well. So um, if you have pink or red eyes in a baby, it will look, you can't really see its eyes through its skin because the, the, the eyes are born shut, sealed shut. Um, whereas the dark eyed babies, you can see the black eyes very clearly through the skin. Um, so it's it's kind of quite apparent who's going to be pink eyed and who's going to be black eyed and then they get the pigment through in the next days it becomes more and more pronounced um this is particularly nice when you've got marked rats because you can see the splotches and the markings where they're going to be as long as it's a dark color that's going to appear and um, the kind of paler colors take longer to show through and then once you get into about day seven or eight you actually start so, well, seven or eight maybe six or seven i'd say actually um mugs started about day five but they're a little ahead because they've had really good food and they're fat um, so they just start seeing sometimes you see a little bit of dandruff drop out on the skin it like makes the sky, skin look a little bit dry that's fine and normal that just means the skin the hair starting to push through then they'll start getting this slight fuzz um that's really really lovely and then after a couple more days it'll be proper fur and um, so mogs now are, are kind of week old have actually started getting proper fur um isola's fosters here they they're kind of probably a couple of days behind developmentally, um, which is not surprising given their size, and they, they're just starting to get the fuzz stage, stage now, so you can tell the colours. Um, and that is actually an interesting thing, trying to judge the colours. So I now know that in, in Mog's Litter I have um, a lovely mix of three topaz and three agouti. Um, I had the possibility of having agouti, topaz, buff, black, and the Dumbo and Top, so I do have Dumbo and Top ears as well, but I don't have the black and the buff, and I could tell that probably from about two days ago. Um, and that's because you can tell the bellies. So agouti based rats, so that includes topaz, that includes cinnamon, that includes various things like this, have something called demarcation, which means they've got a white belly and there's a line that kind of goes down the side like that, which shows very clearly. Once they've started getting fuzz on the belly, if it's pale, you know they're agouti based. So that was very nice and simple, even though I've got a really dark one, um, a really dark chap. He actually just doesn't carry red eye dilute, which is what gives you topaz, makes him quite dark. Um, I'll try and show you at some point. Um, maybe later on when they're a little bit older and Mog isn't feeding them. Um, just to see the difference, it's quite pronounced. Um, you'll get Not every variety shows up that well when they're carrying something, but um, Red Eye Dilute does change colours even when it's only carried um, quite well. So that's the kind of thing, you, you'll start getting a good indication of the colour in this week, but you may not be absolutely firm. I'm pretty sure because I know what my rats kind of carried. I know there was no chance of something like Russian getting in there, though I'd have probably been able to tell. Um, but some, some varieties can be a little bit more subtle. You may not know whether something's pink-eyed white or a Himalayan, for instance, until it's a bit older because it won't have any nose points. Um, so it's kind of a, a watch this space. You've probably got a far better idea what's in there, but some of the subtler hues you may not be able to tell apart yet. Um, you should be able to tell if your rat's marked and actually you should also be able to tell whether your rat's Dumbo or Top Ear. So I'm quite lucky I've got both in this litter. Um, it was a case of there was a fair chance of it, but we didn't know if dad carried Dumbo or not, and Dumbo's recessive, so both parents have to carry it. Mog is Dumbo, so she definitely carries it. Um, so yes, half my litter are Dumbo and half are top -eared. Um And you can tell that, well technically you can tell it from birth. I'm not very good at that. I can kind of make a guess, but I don't trust myself. But after about two or three days, the ears when they're born are kind of folded shut against the head, and then they will slowly kind of peel out and turn into normal ears. And as they peel out, it becomes more and more obvious. Um, I'll stick up a little photo in this corner, which just shows you how I kind of ear them. And that is, I draw a line between the nose and the eye, and that kind of forms a line on the head. And if the ear kind of points above it, and it usually has a little corner on it as well, that's top ear. If the ear sits below it or kind of level with it and points that way, um, then it's a Dumbo. And they're usually more rounded Dumbo ears as well. I would say if you've got both in the litter, it's it's actually pretty easy to tell them apart once you've seen it a few times. If you haven't, it becomes a lot harder. <laughs> so I've sent a few, a few times looking at some two top ears 
and one of them's got a bit of a low set rounded ear and it's like is this a dumbo no no it's not a dumbo um if it's it's usually obvious if it is a dumbo but yes um by the end of the week it, it's fairly obvious and by the end of next week it'll be blindingly obvious if you've got dumbos or top ears which is good so those are the main things to look out for developmentally as well um i will say in terms of socialization um the babies are not going to get a lot out of it at this stage um your handling is very much done for your benefit which means that if the mum doesn't enjoy it don't do it um it's not fair on her um there's nothing wrong with leaving just feeding her and leaving her in this cage and um, my mums are the type of rats that will run up to the cage bars and want to come out and have a cuddle and do things and see things um, they're very relaxed with me but that's not every every rat and that's fine they've got a lot of maternal instincts going on and um, what i will never do is i won't stick my hand right in the nest in front of mum um, and not expect to be bitten to be fair i've never been bitten yet but that's partly because i don't put my mums through that um she her, all her instincts are telling her to protect the babies and um, she's created a lovely nest a nice safe haven for them she doesn't want even trusted people she'd react exactly the same to her cage mates if they were went near the nest she doesn't want them messing with her babies and that's natural and that's fine and, and I, I want to give her that space so whenever i'm handling the babies i will encourage mum to come out put her in a separate cage and then handle them put them back put mug back afterwards usually with a treat to say thank you and um, that's plenty for Mog. Mog loves her treats. She's very food motivated still, bless her. Um, but yes, so that's one thing that's quite important to stress. Um, but yes, you don't need to be handling them. There is studies that show that um, how much the mums lick the babies and how much they nurse the babies may alter their eventual temperament. Um, you could say that if you kind of took them out and handled them and stroked them individually or kind of like bits and pieces, that may influence their overall temperament. It is possible, but I don't think it would make a significant ish kind of difference at this stage. And you don't want to keep them out too long. You don't want to let their body temperatures drop. You want to keep them warm. It can be nice, particularly in winter, if you're in a cold room, um, to have a little heat pad for them to sit on. But again, you don't want to sit them on that too for too long because that could get too hot and babies can suffer more from overheating them to being too cold. So generally, I'll get them out, quick check, a couple of minutes, put them back in. By the end of the week, they've now got to the stage where they've like, got a reasonable fuzz on them. They keep warmth much better. So I'll have them out for, let's say, five, five minutes and just sit there and stare at them because some litters you just can't help but it. i don't i don't know why you'll have some litters that you feel a bit distant from and you just kind of go through the motions and some litters that you just absolutely smitten by mog's litter is very much a smitten by one but it helps that me and mog have a very special bond and um she's doing such a good job as well um so that's where we are I'm trying to think if there's anything more on week one um things to look out for what you can find is mum can get seriously freaked out and um not want to feed so moving her into a smaller cage, I talk about that a little bit on the birthing side of things, that can help. Um, if she's a very stressy mum, try covering most of the cage. So she's got a bit of room for airflow, but it's quite dark and safe in there. Try and not make a lot of kind of unusual noises or unusual smells around her in that first week. She's uber protective. Um, it's generally just being very respectful of her and her babies and her space um, and also like she's not there to be your toy at that stage she's she's there to be a mother to the babies so let her so it's like now um i could get mug out to show you i could tempt her off the nest trail easily but she's clearly feeding she's now got a lot of mouths to feed and she hasn't even popped up a head actually bless her so she's um well and truly in her job and that is that is the right thing um to leave her be like that so those are the main things for week one um i'll do a video on um, fostering just because it might be quite useful um, I will say that um, actually as a quick one on week one, stillborns are fairly normal, but it's not al it's also not abnormal to lose the occasional baby through that first week. It's probably the highest risk week in ter terms of baby loss. Um, it's not one to beat yourself up about if it happens, but keep an eye on them. Make sure they are getting adequately fed and consider fostering if they're not. Um, don't go down the route of trying to hand feed because effectively you're filling their bellies full of less nutrient rich food um, unless you have absolutely no other option so there's no foster mum available and they usually you can usually find one if you try hard enough and you know enough good people in your area um but yes if you do have to hand feed for any reason to supplement mum's milk then make sure you do it after she's fed them so you kind of her, her milk gets the preference and then you just top it up but it's not something I would generally advise. Um, I'm uh, trying to think what else. 
that's probably about it for week one and at least in terms of my point of view um, it's probably a week where some breeders would consider culling down litters if they were big it's not something that I really would ever choose that full stop would ever choose to do because I do things like we do this fostering um, instead but it's one that some breeders do think about that um, it's not one that I'm going to cover because I don't know it it's not something that I choose to do for, um, anyway so I would just say make sure like kind of really recap don't overfeed but make sure she's got extra supplements as a priority um, make sure you handle on her terms um, make sure you give her a space and don't handle the babies in front of her um, she may very cutely take them off your hand and put them in the nest that is not cute she's actually quite stressed she wants them back in the nest where they belong <laughs> um, and just kind of be respectful for your mums and just keep an eye on the baby development if you have the option it's quite pleasant and interesting to watch and they grow so fast at this stage but if you can't it's not the end of the world you can always have another litter in the future and the mum may be happier with you handling them the priority is very much um, let mum do her stuff they're generally very good mums and Mog is definitely living up to that. So over and out from me, and um, I shall speak shortly on a completely, slightly different topic.